<laughs> okay, thank you all. Welcome. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to one of um, our sociology department events for undergraduate students and alumni. Um, so I would like to thank um, Peter Evans and his staff for helping us set up this um, interesting event which, with the title Life After College, where my UCLA degree has taken me. Uh, my name is Stefan Timmermans. I am the chair of the sociology department. Um, and I'd like to um, introduce you all to four extraordinary accomplished um, people who all have in common that they uh, graduated from UCLA and they already have been discovering lots of other ties among the four of them. But the other thing they have in common, they all graduated with a uh, sociology degree. And I like to, we're going to have this very informal format where um, I'll ask them some questions to get us started, but then I'll turn it over to you to um, um, ask them questions as well. Um, so let me quickly introduce them, and then I'll ask them to introduce um, themselves in, in greater detail. Um, next to me is Timothy Harris, who is Senior Vice President of Business Operation of the LA Lakers. And he already told me that he's not carrying any tickets with him, <laughs> so uh, don't ask him. Um, next to him is Crystal Walden, founder and CEO, CEO of um, Crystal Spa. Then we have Susan Kellogg president of VF uh, Contemporary Brands, and John, John Kobara, um, executive vice president and CEO of California Community Foundation. But I'll ask um, our speakers to um, tell, tell the audience a little more about what they're doing, and then maybe later how they got there. And if you could use the microphone that was uh, next to you. So, okay, excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm glad I get, now I know why this chair was last to be taken. Um, uh, it's not, it, it, Timothy was what my parents called, we'll go with Tim today. Um, yeah, Tim here, my name's Tim Harris, I'm the Senior Vice President of Business Operations and the Chief Marketing Officer for the Lakers. Um, I've been with the Lakers, uh, I started with the Forum in 1990, um, moved over to the Lakers when we sold the Forum uh, in the mid-90s and I've been with them ever since. Um, in essence, I oversee the day-to-day -day business operations for the team. Um, I don't have anything to do with acquiring players, trading players, or signing players. <laughs> so um, so you, you cannot ask me anything that has to do with players because I, I truly will not know. Um, you know, I'm, I guess by definition I, I oversee the business of basketball, not the basketball of basketball. Um, and what that includes, it includes um, pretty much all the revenue streams, which is ticket sales, sponsorship sales, uh, broadcast and media sales, um, community relations, uh, the entertainment side, um, our, our social media side, so everything, everything that's the business side of it. Um, the, I, I guess the, um, the highlight of it for me uh, took place about exactly a year ago. Uh, you may have read about this when the, the Lakers negotiated a uh, local television contract with Time Warner Cable. Um, I was the lead negotiator for that agreement, and it's, um, it's the largest broadcast agreement in any team sports history. Um, it, it probably by 5x exceeds the value of the team. Um, so in essence, it, you know, it makes you wonder, like, they, you know, Time Warner's renting something that um, they probably could have come in and, and bought the team with. Um, so... That's pretty much how I spend every day. Um, you know, we're here for a short period of time. I won't take up any more time because I'd rather hear what they're doing than what I'm doing. Hello, my name is Crystal Walden. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, well, I'm an owner of a health and fitness spa in downtown, right by the Stable Center. <laughs> um, I actually started my life journey or entrepreneurship in track and field. Um, I ran, I became a track athlete when I was eight years old. That's when my parents discovered I was good and was like, scholarship, yeah, we need to make you run so we can not pay for college. <laughs> and so um, I was really blessed to come here and actually run track in 96 to 2000. Um, after that, 
I decided to try out corporate because unfortunately injuries, I had stress fracture injuries, ended my career. So I decided to go ahead and excel in corporate, try corporate, see if I liked it. And I was a buyer at Guess Incorporated and then I switched over to Macy's. And it was a valuable experience. I will always recommend um, anyone to be in the corporate world even if it's not really in your your desire to you know work for someone else or be in corporate and you want to own your own business that experience is just like going to grad school so I had a great four-year run in corporate I learned a lot from being a buyer because um, we had to each department that I manage it's funny because I um, was buying men's clothes and Liz Claiborne was one of um, one of our vendors where she used to work at and um, I learned so so much but my passion was health and fitness. Um, it was fun making people look good, <laughs> but it wasn't gratifying because it's like it's clothes. Like I have respect for clothes, but every, you know, waking up every day just picking clothes for the next season just didn't do it for me. So I took a leap in faith and I left that great corporate job because that money was great. At 20, I was like 22, I had a great salary, 401k, the whole nine. But that burning desire to do my own thing and to be more meaningful in the world and, and have more, um, what can I say, have more purpose in my life, I decided to open up a spa. So my spa right now is focused on yoga and massage therapy, and I'm right now studying to be a physical therapist as well. Hi, I'm Susan Kellogg, and I work for VF Corporation, which is a $10 billion company, so I am unlike Crystal, the antithesis. Um, I am knee-deep in corporate America. I've been knee-deep in corporate America for the last 28 years. Um, I started my career from interviewing on campus at UCLA, which I recommend. Even if you don't want to work anywhere that you're interviewing for, it's really great exposure. So I got my first break right here on campus. I interviewed with Macy's San Francisco. I flew up on a Friday to um, interview with the CEO to get into their executive training program. And my number one motivation was um, P&G was, uh, was located in Cincinnati, Ohio. So they also wanted to interview me that same Friday. So I said Cincinnati, San Francisco, Cincinnati, San Francisco, and San Francisco won. And coincidentally, UCLA was playing Cal the next day. So it was absolutely <laughs> perfect. So I figured whatever happens with this interview, at least I'm going to see the football game on their dime. So I invited you know, 20 of my roommates, and we had a great time. But needless to say, I got the job, I was in the training program, and that really is a good way to learn the business from the bottom up, and also learn the business on someone else's dime. And so I was there for eight years, and then got a job in New York. I went from the buying side to the manufacturing and wholesale side, which actually I also recommend, because if, you're, if you've played both sides, you know the playbook, and it's really, really valuable. So it was a very easy transition for me. I was in New York for the last 20 years. Just note, I went to San Francisco for one year because I thought it would be great experience. I stayed for eight. I went to New York for one year because I thought it would be great experience, and I stayed for 20. So you really never know where life will take you. Um, but what I'm doing right now is really gratifying because most jobs in my industry are really in New York City. And being a Californian, it's not so easy to live there, but it's a great place to work professionally. So. I basically gave up my family, the ocean, and everything I love about California, my surfing, and went to New York, but really did quite well professionally because that's where all the jobs are in my industry. And I'm really, really lucky that I got one of a handful of jobs. There's only a handful of jobs doing what I do in LA, and I have one of them. So I'm really happy to be back. It's been two years. I'm running four fashion companies for VF. VF owns 30 fashion companies, a lot of companies that you know like Vans and Reef and North Face and Wrangler. I happen to run four companies, John Varvatos, Splendid, Ella Moss, and Seven for All Mankind. So these are all the high-end fashion brands. And I feel very, very fortunate to love what I do every day. I don't know a lot of people who can say that. Wow, it's an impressive group. Um, I'm John Kabar, and thank you for coming too. Uh, I think I'm the old man demographic on this crowd here. Um, I, was, uh, I went to UCLA in the 70s, and I was uh, a community services commissioner twice, elected to the student council, and that kind of got me involved with a lot of different things. Um, kind of fast forward, I, I spent three and a half years working for the California Youth Authority in maximum security institutions counseling juvenile felons, and that's how I started my career, which my dad was pretty worried about. That was how I was going to spend my UCLA degree. 
Um, and then just fast forward, what I found is uh, the UCLA degree, the education I got here, and the people that I met catapulted me into almost anything I wanted to. Uh, I ultimately went through three startups. Um, I was at the forefront of the cable television industry, um, the online uh, education industry, and as well as the now the virtual textbook industry. Those were the startups that I was involved with. I was interrupted by um, a lot of nonprofit work that I did along the way. I ran Big Brothers Big Sisters of, of Southern California, for example, and a number of other things. I was also vice chancellor here at UCLA. I worked for Chancellor Young for 10 years during that time period. But um, during that time, I went through three graduate programs in between when you don't know what you want to do. That's what you do is go to graduate school. Um, and then you tell your parents something else. That's the other thing you do. But anyway, um, what it, I ended up um, g getting on a board from th some UCLA connections about 10 years ago uh, on the California Community Foundation Board of Directors, and, uh, which is the 48th largest foundation in the United States. We're a $1.3 billion operation that is the endowment for Los Angeles. And we raise money and we manage other people's foundations and we give away money. And I'm responsible for getting the money and giving it away. So we raise about $150 million a year, and we give away about $160 million a year. Um, and so I'm, I'm responsible for the acquisition of funds. We, today we manage 1,800 foundations um, for Los Angeles and for families and, and corporations in Los Angeles. So it's a fascinating. We're 98 years old. Um, it's a blend of business, philanthropy, nonprofit work, civic engagement, um, and public policy. So it's kind of a great place for what I want to do, and being now in Los Angeles for the last 37, 38 years, um, moving from Northern California to come down here to go to UCLA. But I, at the kind of the punchline for me is, for you guys, is you know, people say, what are you going to do with a sociology degree? Which everybody asks you that question. And the answer is truly whatever you want. And hopefully we get to those questions today. Be actually a good point to pick up your last issue here of how the sociology degree then translated into the positions that you started off in or, or um, ended up at. Does anybody want to reflect on the process by which they became a social major and how that ended up becoming um, the, truth, you mean. Right. Um, <laughs> the embellished truth? I'm looking for the embellished truth. Okay. I'll start. Um, I actually like watching people. I'm a people watcher. Um, I actually sometimes will sit at the Grove and watch when people walk by and kind of guess their lifestyle based on their in interaction with their family and their kids, their boyfriend, girlfriend, or um, what have you. Um, I love people. I love the way um, the way we work. Like. My, one of my mantras is that I believe that as people, we don't spend enough time with ourselves. When I'm saying that is we worship, there's no Apple people here, right? We worship Apple computers, Blackberries, you know, our car, whatever, um, more than we do our human body, mind, body, and spirit. And so that's kind of like I, f I feel that that's my calling is to bring that awareness back to the to humanity that really our human body is the best thing this planet's ever seen like you're sitting right now listening to us talk and your heart is beating and you're not telling it to consciously you know your lungs are filling it itself up with oxygen that gets your you know your um, that gets the oxygen to your your cells that runs through your veins so that right now you can move you can write all your notes that you're writing right now. Um, so with sociology, it's like when you're in any business and anything that you choose, actually, you have to interact with people. Um, even if you're behind of a computer, eventually you have to interact with someone. If it's going to be your boss, it's going to be your coworkers, it's going to be your colleagues, it's going to be any, you know, out your customers or whatever that may be. You have to understand people in any realm of business to, in order to do business. Because what I've learned, especially being an entrepreneur, I've been an entrepreneur for eight years now, um, starting from ground up, literally from nothing. M the biggest lesson that I learned is you're more successful on relationships, meaning you have, you know, the person knowing you, not just your name and knowing, okay, you work at whatever, you know, Macy's, that's not enough. 
but for her to actually know me, that's Crystal. I met her. We did this event together. We had dinner. You know, she's a nice person. We get along. She's going to be inclined to do business with me first. So you have to understand how to interact with someone. And you have to understand the different realms of our emotions, the different realms of how we think, the different realms of life experiences, you know, based on how, what you study. So with sociology, just like, you know, he said, um, you can do anything, literally. Much, much simpler. Um, first of all, why sociology? You're not going to like this as the department chair, but I, I'm going to tell you unplugged. Um, basically, I wanted to graduate on time. I was very anxious to get out in the work world. And um, so I went to my counselor, Mary Jo Schmidt, who's retired now, but she was part of the sociology department. I don't know if they still assign you to someone, but I suggest you listen to your counselor. Um, and I just said, here. And I gave her my transcripts my junior year. And I said, this is everything I've studied. Tell me what it means. <laughs> and then um, she said, uh, well, do you have you know, anything in mind? I said, well, I've just taken classes that were appealing to me. And my professors are quite upset with me because half my classes were on South Campus because I took a lot of art. And half my classes were on, I'm sorry, the other way around, North Art, South Science. So I took a lot of, you know, wonderful classes like calculus and physics and organic chemistry and, you know, maybe pre-med and maybe, you know, e-com. And, you know, I was very much all over the map. So I said, I have two things. I want good grades and I want to get out of here on time. She said, well, that's easy, sociology. She goes, every time you've taken a sociology class, you've gotten an A. Every single time, 100%. And I can guarantee that if you, do, if you take these classes your senior year, you will be out on time. So why sociology? Now, I can tell you how it's helped me in business tremendously because there are books written on what Crystal is talking about, and it's IQ versus EQ. And you need both. To be a very successful leader, you need to be both, you know, emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence. And it's very rare to have the combination of both. It's like being left-brained and right-brained. And I never really understood in UCLA what my teachers were saying because I'd go to an art studio class. You're taking up a valuable seat. You know, this should be an art major seat. This is a class of 20 people. You are being really irresponsible by being here. So unless you're serious about an art major, you know, I suggest you leave. Now, this was the 80s, so maybe things are different. But um, so what I found out was afterwards, when I was interviewing, I took some testing in order to get my first job, and I was 50.5 right and 49.5 left, which explains my entire college curriculum, which is why I couldn't decide, because I had both. And being in business, you really do need art and science. And even though I got into my career because of the Cal game, it ended up being a really perfect career for me because in the business of fashion, I have a very serious P&L responsibility, which is all numbers, so I get to use every bit of my South Campus. But at the same time, fashion is all about art and emotional purchasing. Nobody needs another pair of $100 jeans. They just don't, especially when you're in a recession. So I, I find that the idea of studying groups of people and the way they interact there's two things that make at least me successful and my team successful, and it's people number one and product number two. And if you have both of those things and you're highly optimizing both of those things, you always win. So I was undeclared when I got here, um, like maybe some of you, and I had this girlfriend who was a lot smarter, and I don't know exactly what she saw in me, but she took me by the hand on Bruin Walk all the time and said, what are you doing? You're just stupid. You don't do anything. You don't... You're not involved. You don't have a major. God, I don't know why I'm with you. And it's just, <laughs> so it was a rant that I went through quite a bit. And um, she was a sociology major. And I said, well, maybe I'll become a You should. It's about how things work. You'll learn how things work. And I said, I do want to know how things work. And I was interested. So I went to a class with her. And hey, that was really good. And I said, I'm, I'm going to be a sociology major. I never really declared it. I just told people, right? And at the beginning of my third year, I went to my counselor, and I took my transcripts, and it was like a, like a bad poker hand, you know, I was just looking at my, I'm going, and I threw the transcripts at my counselor, and I said, what do I got? You know, what is that? And she said, what do you think you are? I said, I'm a sociology major. And she said, it's really interesting, John, you need to take sociology classes. It's just a weird thing. And if you take sociology classes, you'll become a, I said, what am I? She goes, you are pre-law. You have completed the constitutional law series. I don't even know how you did that. You need two classes, and you've done with poli sci, and you are pre-law. I am? Yeah, you're totally pre-law. 
I said, well, I'm a sociology man. You start taking sociology classes. So I added sociology as a major, and I was not in a rush to leave. I did not, <laughs> I did not want to go anywhere. I wanted to take more classes. I was a. No, nope, no, nope. I was five years. I was a five-year guy. I, I, I milked it for everything I could get, and uh, I was involved in student government, I said, and, and a lot of other extracurricular activities. But I really went in the back door of sociology. And um, what has already been said is it has helped me. I, I have this phrase I use all the time, which is we go, which is what is going on. What is going on and why is it going on? And I just I ask that, I think about that, and I reflect on classes that I take, take, took at UCLA and other classes I've taken and, and how to think about the way things work um, and how they can work better. And I think that's um, what ultimately my ex-girlfriend long ago pushed me into the major. Dating market for social majors in order to attract more people. Tim. Um, I'm going to make all you feel better right now. Um, <laughs> You know, when I arrived, I was a soccer player. I played soccer here. And I have to tell you that um, in choosing a major, I wasn't looking at all beyond UCLA. I, I had no foresight whatsoever whatsoever what I was going to do. And, um, you know, I wanted to play soccer. And I remember meeting with a counselor, and he said, what do you, what do you want to major in? And I said, let's make this easy. Which has the least amount of math? And he, he, he said, well, you gotta, you're going to have to get beyond stats. And beyond that, at the time, that was all you had to do. You're going you're gonna to have to get beyond stats, and that's it. And I said, that's it. That's done. I'm in. Um, now, I'd always been sort of a people person. And, um, you know, when I, when I came out, now I had to start thinking about what I was going to do and, with this sociology major. And, and I remember a, a key juncture in the negotiations with Time Warner when – I said, this is the per perfect time. We're, we're, we're a little bit you know, apart on issues. And I said, this is the perfect time for me to bring up Durkheim. Because you know, th this is exactly what's needed in this situation. Um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're a social major, you know, I, don't, I don't necessarily, again, I, I don't think I've ever really used the principles that I learned um, you know, in, in the major. But you're constantly, as everyone says, you're constantly thinking about people. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're really constantly thinking about people and, and how people act and how people interact. And, you know, we've got the, for, with the Lakers, we've got 4,000 season ticket holders who own 12,000 tickets. And, you know, they've got this sort of collective spirit. They've got a collective soul. Um, they, they tell us how they feel. And, and generally, they all sort of have a like mind. Now, I know that these 4,000 people aren't getting together on a regular basis and saying, hey, how do we want to do it, and who's got proxy to vote for us. It, it, it comes about. And this sort of collective identity and this collective soul, you know, to a, to a sports organization, season ticket holders, they're the holy grail. And, and yet we have, to, we have to involve ourselves in them, we have to listen to them, and this is what it's all about to me. And again, I can't, I, you know, put a gun to my head and I could not tell you what sort of sociological philosophy that comes from but I can tell you that I recognize it and I understand that we you know we will live in a world where you don't do companies don't do business with companies business people do business with people and and that's what you get from this major is an appreciation for the human factor and it's it, you know I'm basically saying what everyone else is saying is you begin to understand ah, I get it people act individually and people act collectively and sometimes People act collectively without even getting together to understand that they're going to act collectively. That's what, to me, I got from the major. But trust me, going into it, I didn't intend to get that from the major. I just intended to avoid math. <laughs> now, but uh, <laughs> we might want to revisit that part. Um, so it strikes me that, that all, pro probably all of you are in a position of hiring people or bringing people within your organization or company. So I was wondering, what are you looking for in um, you know, young, young people that you might want to hire? Joe? John? We, um, it's a, it's, I'll tell you guys this, it's a it's crazy market. And uh, we've hired, we, we're only 62 staff, but um, we've hired 20 people the last six months or so. And, um, we get 500 resumes for any position. 
Um, so it's a it's a process, and we you know people that want to now move from corporate into philanthropy or nonprofit, or people who want to do something different, or people that are dissatisfied with their careers and trying to shift. So we get everything. We get the overqualified, and we get the underqualified. Um, and what we do is we take people through a very um, pretty deep process to understand not so much of their competent, because frankly, competence is, is, is the base bar. <laughs> if you don't have the basic skills, experience, know how to do the job, you're not even in the game. So, you know, so in the, the, after that, it's about really understanding whether there's, we call, we have a passion diagnostic. We, you, are you really passionate? Well, you're going to tell us about that because that's what we want to know. Everybody says they're passionate. Everybody says they're going to prove they're passionate, but they're not. It goes back to the notion of purpose. Are, are you aligned with purpose? And um, we don't care how many degrees you have. We really don't. Um, we don't care what your last salary was. So we ask five questions. We do this on an email interview because we don't have time to talk to you, and we don't want to waste your time. And then we find out if you can write and if you can write thoughtfully. And it's amazing what people do and do very poorly. And the basic it says, why are you applying for this job again? Which seems like a very innocent question. Then people start writing, oh. And then, why are you leaving the position you just left? Or why were you, you, know, why were you laid off or whatever it was? You know? And then we go through these, these basic questions. So after we do that, we bring you in and we take you through a little process to do the passion diagnostic. And um, what's interesting is what we are looking for, and we're not looking for the best resume or the deepest this. We're looking for people that really have a commitment to the mission after they've reached the basic qualifications, right? And that, that's all the whole process is about. Everybody, and people don't get it that are interviewing. They don't, most people don't get it. And, you know, it's about critical thinking. It's asking good questions. It's really about understanding why you think this is the right place for you. We have great dental benefits, right? If the commute's not long, great. You know, it's a nice place to work. Yes, yes. But why again? You, heart, mind, alignment. And that's not an easy question. It doesn't matter if you're 22 or 62. They, everybody has trouble answering this question. And we, we get those people out of the process as fast as possible because we don't want to waste their time. I mean, they should be off doing something else, applying their skills and life to something else. Because we want um, people that are really committed to the mission. We don't have the highest salaries. Um, we think we're doing something pretty important. And if you can prove that, we're going we're gonna to hire you. I'm hiring. Well, I'm going to start with the right out of school because I think that's probably the most germane. But, you know, obviously in any big corporation, you know, I'm hiring presidents and um, all the way down to the assistant to the assistant to the assistant, right? So it's anything from a $30,000 employee to a $500,000 employee, which is quite a range. So I would say that there's differences depending on what level you're interviewing for. Um, but one thing that we like to do is even though we're a big company, a big corporation, we like to operate as a small company. And we like several people to interview you. And we really hire by consensus. And, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, when you're coming out of school, it's not really about your experience because you haven't had a whole lot. So it really is about your ambition and your passion and your, you know, ability to learn and your open-mindedness and really a collaborative spirit because you know, back to sociology groups of people you know you can't get anything done and even basketball is the same way I know you're not part of the sport but um, you know as Magic Johnson taught us all up in uh, northern you know part of uh, the United States you know one great player on a team of five doesn't win games so you really need to be a highly functioning team so we're not after individual contributors because they fail you know, we're not after Stanford MBAs because we don't really care. You know, if you're not a team player, then you're not going to be successful in our organization. Um, honestly, my company is, bless you. <laughs> totally okay. <laughs> um, like I said, I've been in, uh, I've owned my business for eight years. So, we typically do more partnerships than hiring. And I say that in a sense, um, I say that to, um, 
excuse me. I say that because most of my partners I work with are doctors. And so they tend to work at a hospital. Um, so in my line of business, it's better to have that referral base um, partnership. Um, I have hired um, college students before, but mostly on an internship um, basis. And when I look for a college student, um, the first thing I'm looking for is, yeah, I do want you to be smart. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so I am going to ask you about your grades. Um, I'm also looking for your ambition. So just because you email me saying, hey, I'm interested, I'm going to ignore it for the first couple of emails because I want to see how badly you want it. Um, I learned that when I was looking for jobs. Um, I actually work at this clinic. I won't say the name. Don't ask me, please. Um, I work at this clinic now, and I did the, you know, with the new generation, it's about applying online. They really don't want to see your face. They don't even want you to call. So I play by the rules, even though that's foreign to me because when, you know, I've had my very first job, I was 15, you just go to the place you want to work at and write, you know, do your resume, you fill out their application, application and you just keep calling them until they hire you. So I play by the rules and I did it for like a year and a half through, through the website, through online, and I didn't like it and it didn't get me anywhere. So I went old school and I walked up to the director and I said, here's my resume. This is the reason why I want to be here, you know, um, so forth. And I got the job the old-fashioned way. So I say that again to go back to what I was saying earlier. I look for the same thing. I want you to come track me down because if you're tracking me down, that means you really want to be a part of my company. If you tell me about my website, that means you did your homework and you read about, like he was saying, my mission statement. And you read about our purpose and the reason why we're doing this. And same thing with a nonprofit, you would have to really have passion because as a company that's eight years, if um, you haven't heard yet, it is very true that if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting your own business literally from nothing, it does take some time. And I have a sprinter mentality, it's really eating me up because I didn't want to be there already. But you know, that ten the 10 years that you'll hear, it'll take 10 years just for people to even know who you are. Sometimes that's true. Most times that's true. So I say that to say we don't have high salaries. You know, so you're basically doing it on an entrepreneur, um, on an internship, wanting the experience. And exper experience is very valuable because it's not always about the money. I mean, yes, you do have to eat and you have to have insurance and, and so forth. But in what I've learned, my experience um, in life and all the different jobs and even being an entrepreneur outweighs my salary I had when I was at Macy's. Like if I was still at Macy's, I would not be sitting here right now talking to all of you and be able to share with you all the experiences I've had, all the bumps and bruises, all the falls, but also all the successes that I've also had. So you have to be very passionate. You have to be very, um, very, very ambitious. And you have to, um, you have to make a, you have to want to make a difference in my in my line of work because it is about making a difference it's about making our society healthier so you have to be passionate about that because it's really hard i mean we have mcdonald's on every corner trying to tell somebody don't go there is like the hardest thing in the world <laughs> um I, I i read today that that um in order to keep pace with current unemployment the world needs to create in the next 10 years 600 million jobs and that will still leave 900 million people earning less than two dollars a day. So that's that's my PSA for grad school. Um, you know, there's a there's a difference between getting the job and doing the job. Um, and it's going to take two two skill sets sometimes. Um, show me show me your hands if any of you are interested in getting into sales. You know, sales where you're sending cold calling, sending out you know information on your product emailing information on your product, trying to get a call back, not getting callbacks, maybe getting a meeting, asking your friends and your colleagues if they know anybody interested in your product. Show me, raise, okay, you know what I just described? I just described a job search. That's a job search, guys. Uh, okay, none of you want to get in sales, but guess what? To get the job, you've got to sell the most important product you'll ever sell in your whole entire life, and it's yourself. 
Okay, so you, you're going to have to get your head around that because you can't, you might have grandiose dreams about the job you want to do, but you can't get it unless you understand how to get it. Okay, and, you know, you, we, you know, trust me, we interview a lot of people, and, and passion is so, so important, okay? But, you know, Disney's not going to hire you just because you tell them how much you dig riding the Matterhorn. <laughs> you have to show a knowledge. That, that's the product. I mean, when they come and tell me, when I sit down with people and they, you know, somebody starts telling me how much they love Kobe, you know, I start, like, glossing over. You know, come and talk to me about, that's the product of the business, the, the product, what, we, what you see on the floor, that's the product of the business. That's not the business, okay? Tell me you love Kobe if you're going to try and, you know, become a point guard. But, you know, you want to come in with a knowledge of the business. And, and really, a job search is not unlike dating. You know, this is sort of the human factor. It's not unlike dating. You want to express an interest. You want to let them know that you're interested in the job. But you don't want to, you don't want to stalk them because then you're going to freak them out, Right? Right. When you get the interview, which is akin to your first date, right, you don't want to walk in and talk just about yourself, okay? You want to have had a little bit of, you want to have done your homework and learn a little bit about them, all right? Who goes on a date and just talks about themselves and tell me how many times you have a second date? <laughs> it doesn't happen. But if you go in and you're interested in them, pull out information. Hey, I understand you know, somebody comes and talks to me, hey, I understand you did that deal with Time Warner and there's going to be a Spanish RSN and, a, and an English language RSN. What's that like? Wow, they did some homework. Tell me about your secondary ticketing. How's that work for you? What are the challenges? All right, now they're engaging me. We're going to have a good date here. All right? <laughs> I'm interested. You know, there's the old saying, if you want to sell something, prepare not to. All right? Come in and show that you're worth, you're, you have value, not you're just coming in saying, gee, I hope this guy gives me a job because I've got student loans to pay off. All right, so it's about passion for sure. All right, but it's about knowledge of the product. It's not, it's not hey, come in and give me a handout. All right, I have, I have little boys and they, and they play soccer now and they seem that they get a trophy whether they have won every game or lost every game. It's sort of like this participation society that we live in right now. And I think it, that flows into job searches. Hey, I'm here, I, I got my degree, I participated. Can I have a job now? It's not going to work. It doesn't, it's not how it works. It's like John says, we don't care. We don't care. It's time for you to prove to us that you're ready. And you come in, you've done your homework, you interview us. We don't necessarily interview you. Sure. Go ahead. So one thing I like to it, Wow. Um, the most powerful way to get the attention. If you're going to be in marketing and sales, exactly as was stated, to get attention of your, on your resume, besides stalking, um, is if you're introduced. Right? If somebody says, hey, you got to check out this resume, somebody that knows somebody. Now, supposedly the resume is good and it's been well done, but you need to differentiate yourself from the pile if you're that serious. Because being introduced, is powerful because you have to figure out what to do with that letter, <laughs> right? You get that email, you go, do we follow up with the email that, you know, that I, I get these and they, they really make it different. I mean, I'll tell you one funny thing because at a meeting yesterday, we are the most diverse foundation in the United States of the 150,000 foundations, board and staff, diverse in every way you can think of. We just, we just are. We take great pride in that. So part of our hiring is about getting diversity, not just ethnic diversity, all kinds of diversity. We just, we just, we love that. And so the other day, you know, we have to hire Trojans. Okay, so it's just, it's one of the part of, so we have Trojans. So I know, it's a hard thing. So they, the Trojans were being a little uppity the other day. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a UCLA, the, my, my, my boss is uh, double UCLA, the CFO is UCLA, the head of our housing trust, the president of housing trust, UCLA, the head of our programs and all grant making, UCLA. And it, it goes on like that, it's very UCLA. So I had, it's very diverse, <laughs> beneath the top. Yeah, it's very diverse. So anyway, the, the, the Trojans, I had a little meeting with them, and I set them aside, and I said, guys, now shut up, OK? Now listen, what do you think Trojans call Bruins? And they went, uh, this is a trick question. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> Boss. <laughs> so so just, just seriously, seriously, calm down right now. Anyway, so that's how we hire.
Excellent. So I'd like to open the floor now for questions. Um, you can ask questions to individuals or to the entire group. Go ahead. So I'm going to repeat the questions because there's no mics in the audience. So the question is whether you had some uh, business background in your job or whether you picked that up um, through training or through education. Go ahead, Susan. Um, on the job, absolutely. And in my industry, in, in the fashion industry, that really, it's a bottoms up. I mean, I, I joked about a Stanford MBA, and I hate to pick on, on this one individual that I have in mind. But, <laughs> Um, you know, she really expected to be a buyer in two days, you know, a cup of coffee. And, you know, it really doesn't matter in my industry what you come in with in terms of GPA or degree. What really matters is learning the ropes from the bottom up. And I can tell you as a CEO, I'm a much better CEO because my first job was the assistant to the assistant buyer. You know, my buyer threw pencils at me when she wanted my attention, and I decided very quickly my first week, they, they told us two things. There are 40 of you in this executive training class, and only two of you are going to make it. Well, I decided I was going to be one of those two. That was day one. And then my first week after you know, being bombarded with pencils, I decided I'm going to be a buyer one day, and when I'm a buyer, I'm not throwing pencils. So you know, in my industry, it's on, on the job. Yeah, I have to agree with Susan. Um, definitely on the job. Uh, at Macy's, I, I'm not sure if they had it when you were there, but they actually had a program, so it felt like yeah. I was in an MBA, um, uh, like I was in a master program because it was an actual year program where you were in the classroom um, as your job. Um, you'd be in the classroom for a few hours and then you'll go back to your desk and just do your job. But all of my um, experience, to be honest, has been on training. I've been, I was always an apprentice to whoever was that's at the top. I was always, I'll do like, you know, starting from the bottom. I'll, you know, you have to not be so arrogant in a sense, well, I'm not going to do that because that's beneath me. You never want to do that. You do, you do what it takes to learn. And sometimes it's some of the things you won't even imagine, of course, within the morals, like taking out trash. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, but definitely, I would always be an apprentice to someone. And I would always, when my jobs have a, um, seminar or a workshop, I'll always ask, can I go? Even though, you know, it's, you would think you can't go because you're not invited technically because it might be, you know, certain, I hate to say this, please don't throw anything at me. I currently work at USC Physical Therapy, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I know, I know. I'm trying to have the best of both worlds. Don't hate me. <laughs> I love LA and I'm never leaving, so I want the best of both. So anyway, I, I have to say this to explain what I'm saying so I don't sound crazy. So, I'm a physical therapy A because I, I want to go to school there for physical therapy to make Crystal Spa even bigger and better, um, to take it to another level. So. Even though I'm a physical therapy aide, they have classes, they have seminars, they always have some kind of um, research program or something. Technically, I don't, you know, I'm not a student yet, so technically I shouldn't be going, but I'm always asking, can I come? So then I go so that I can get all, I suck up every education that I possibly can in each and every one of my jobs. So don't be afraid to ask, because the worst they can say is no. So if you see an opportunity for you to go learn more, you always ask, can I sh come? Can I come to that meeting? Can I go to that seminar? Can I go to that workshop? Exactly. exactly. So that's how I experience. Um, you know, I think it's the same with me. It was on the job. Um, there's, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think getting a graduate degree is a bad thing at all. Um, it's, it's just, I don't know how much you're going to use it on your first day. You know, when you get into your first job, you're not going to say, well, I remember when I was in this class. Let me apply this now. Um, you know, what, what we fail to do when we get into a job, you're, when, you, when you start out, you're going to be, you know, when you get a job, you get hired someplace, you're going to be put in a department, you're going to be asked to do certain tasks. What 99% of you do is you do that job and you do it well and you do those tasks and yet all sur surrounding you are all the other parts of the company that you never take the time to learn about. And then all of a sudden, three years down the road, you've learned what? That job, those tasks. 
and 20 feet from you is a whole different division of the company that you've never learned anything about. And so there's formal education, which is going to get your graduate degree. And then there's sort of what I would call informal education, where you're sitting at your desk and you ask somebody in another department to go for lunch. Hey, tell me about your challenges. What is your job like? What do you do? What's hard? What's easy? What's new? What's coming? What's old? What should we do? That's sort of an informal education. Either one works, but you're going to, I think, you will move farther with an informal one because you can apply it with what you're doing. Yeah, I would just add that um, it's experiential, just to different, use a different word, I mean experiential education to augment, you know, your theoretical education, whether you're in class or not, because you just, you need to go outside of the box. Um, I, I was in graduate school getting a useless degree um, and trying to figure out what I was going to do next, and I, was, I literally was, I met a trustee of the program but this was in urban studies. It wasn't in urban planning. It was in urban studies, which is totally a useless degree. And the trustee was saying, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And I was making up the stuff. And he was thinking it was great, you know. And, and um, he, was, he had a job for me, right? Anyway, I, I, I got that job. I ultimately had to unwind myself from that job because it, it was a crazy, it's a, too long of a story. But this guy, the trustee, ended up hiring me um, to run his, part of his cable television company. This is before CNN and ESPN and everything else. And I'm a sociology with a, not even finished my master's degree in urban studies. I had no business background at all. And the guy said, I need smart people that can do things for me. And uh, ultimately, I got an MBA because he wouldn't let me run part of the company until I had an MBA, which was just stupid because I didn't learn anything there except got to run part of the company and ultimately was one of the division heads of that company, which became the largest cable television operation in the United States. But um, what I've got to tell you is, so I have an MBA, and oh, very impressive. Um, but running nonprofits, right, I, I tell people all the time, I, I, I can't wait to go back into business because I know what I have to do. I've got to make money. Uh, there's this baby that, if you go into big business, there's a baby called EBITDA. <laughs> and, and some of you go, EBITDA? i never heard of it. But I'm telling you, people on this side will go, EBITDA, which is earnings before income taxes and depreciation allowance. Profit, right? You got to have EBITDA. If you don't have EBITDA, you got nothing, right? So that's easier to focus on, right? Nonprofits, let's sell this cause, raise some money to help this cause, and I got no EBITDA. Well, I have one question for you. If you're uh, just let me raising 150 million, yeah. I, and I can tell you, we've doubled our assets during that time period. Oh, okay. that so, so okay. we're a growth business. Um, but, but my point is, business skills you learn on the job. But I'm saying is, they they apply and they apply to a variety of different kind of platforms. The nonprofit platform, the government platform, the public administration, public policy platform, it's totally a different platform. It takes business skills. But in terms of the financial components, the business model, it's a totally different business model. What I tell people is, people come up to me all the time, they say, hey, I want to do what you do, John. I want to do something good. And I said, whatever. You know, what do you want? And they don't even know what they want. But then I say, look, I will go back into business to rest because nonprofit work is the hardest work. It, it, I, 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 so when I finish this stint, I will go back into business because my nonprofit career, my serial social entrepreneurial career has been interrupted by business, but only because I need to make some more money and it's easier, to be honest with you. Because nonprofit work is the most brutal, challenging and rewarding thing that you'll ever do because you see the need and you don't have the money. And the only way you can get money is go beg for it. <laughs> and begging for money is really a different world, I'm telling you, to meet your budget and to pay for your dental benefits. So that is where business skills get tested in a very, very different way.
Not in my industry at all. In fact, I have three presidents reporting to me, and none of them have their MBA. They've all been on the job. And I feel a little bit guilty about graduate school, especially in an academic setting. So I would like to say one thing, a caveat. It's much more valuable, in my opinion, to graduate, get out in the work world a little bit, experiment, and then go to grad school. And really, it depends on what you want to do. Because very specifically, like in your case, if you didn't have an MBA, you wouldn't have been able to get that job. So I think it's really specific to what you want to do and if an MBA is required. I can tell you right now that in my, my position, you know, with all three of my presidents, they're running about a billion dollars worth of business between the three of them. Um, they have on-the-job experience. They're industry experts. They've been in the fashion business their entire career. Um, you know, they have different strengths and weaknesses, and it really is not part of it in, in my industry. Now, my boss, who's the CEO of VF, who has the $10 billion, 30 companies, he, he needs his MBA. I only have a billion dollars. I don't need it. So that's kind of the difference. $10 well, the, <laughs> the other thing is, I, I just want to say, I've never been in nonprofit, although I'm very involved in philanthropic efforts. And I do want to say, I think the grass is a little bit greener. Because I beg for money almost every day from corporate. Because my job is to get the funding that I need for the ideas that my very creative staff and team have. And the better I'm at getting that money, the more these ideas become reality. So um, I'm going to take, take you on, on that statement. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So if I, ref if I re reiterate your question, the question was how to go into the neighboring departments where you're not doing your internship or you're not working in, and how to package this on your resume in order to leverage as a, for in, your, in a job search. Crystal. What Tim said earlier is uh, really true and valuable. Um, when he was saying inviting someone to lunch, or a lot of times your job will, you know, have outside activities that you just don't want to miss, um, be it uh, employee appreciation day, um, you know, company softball games, um, company picnics, uh, those, you, in, in my, I don't have all the answers, I can only tell you, everything I'm saying today is through my experience, and my experience is the more casual the better, because it won't feel so pressure. Um, I never go to my director and say, hey, I want to do this. I just kind of, when we have our little casual moments, like, you know, we'll do something after work as a group. And when they're talking about this certain seminar or I've seen the email come, come about, I'll ask a question, so how is that seminar and, you know, would I benefit from it? I, I've learned, it, for me, it works in a more casual setting. Um, how do you incorporate that onto your resume? Um, in my resume, I got really creative at the very end of it. Um, if I had, well, I'm running out of space, kind of. But if you have space, because I know that you know, typically it should be only two pages. You can kind of put that as like extra activities or extra interest um, uh, of that, something of that nature, something really creative, but m mainly towards the end. Um, but I do want to say, uh, I just want to say this kind of piggyback on the last question. Your education is really important, um, regardless. Um, like Susan said, it, it, it does matter specialty, because obviously I want to be a physical therapist. I have to go to school. I can't just like you know go hang out with the physical therapist, and now I'm a therapist. That's just not working. But um, your, your degree, your, especially coming from a school like this, I don't know. I don't think you guys really realize what you have. Like, 
all of my experiences came because I came to this from this school. So when I go give my resume or when I go tell people, yeah, I'm a graduate from UCLA, you're like viewed on a whole nother level. You're not viewed, and, it, and, and it's kind of unfortunate because I, I never want to look down upon or talk down upon any other school in the whole world. But if it's you and a Cal State LA student, guess what? You're most likely, your resume is going to get looked at. So, you know, don't, I mean, don't not think about going to school. You, you, that MBA degree, you know, some people may say it's pointless. I, n I think education is never pointless. Education is priceless. You need it regardless. You will eventually use it somewhere down the road, especially in the recession right now. Guess what? They're not looking at anybody who doesn't have a degree. We're in a recession right now. You're, um, you're going against, you're competing with uh, people that have BAs, BS, MBAs, doctorate degrees, PhDs, you have to have a degree and no matter what industry you're going into, the more education the better. That's just, I want to say that. <laughs> okay, a last question. Um, well, it was trial and error. <clears throat> I remember the first time I did an interview, I went for a job interview. And my experience as an athlete was you, when you're interviewed, someone sits down and asks you questions. And you answer them and then you're done. And so I, I went into a job interview um, thinking that that's how it was going to go because I, that's all I knew from what an interview was. And really what it was, was, was this employer wanted to see if I was intelligent, if I was hungry, if I'd done any homework. And it was probably the shortest job interview in the history of job interviews <laughs> because he asked me a couple of questions. I answered the questions. He asked me if I had anything else. I said no because I had no idea what a job interview was. And he said, thanks for coming. And I walked out and I said, there's no way that that went well. I've never had a job interview, but I can't imagine that's how you get hired for a job. And so I quickly figured out that the transition from being an athlete to, in, to being in the business world is different. It takes different skills. Now, what is good about being an athlete and transitioning to the business world is that it, it, you know, if you have been an athlete, and I'm not saying you have to have been an athlete at a high level. If you have been an athlete along the way, it shows that, you know, it shows a, a, you know, a potential employer that you know how to set goals and you know how to achieve goals. You understand the value of time. You understand the value of deadlines. You understand the value of competing. And so being an athlete, you know, does not hurt you. You just have to understand you can't apply everything that you learn being an athlete to transitioning it to business because it is different. Um, for me, I've had my first job since I was 15. At that, back then, that's when you got your, that was, um, that legally, that was an age that you can get your first job. So I think I just always had a, a, a knack for it, um, a, a mind for both. Because um, I actually always had a job, literally, since I was 15. Um, school, track, work. That's all I knew. Um, it was funny because I actually, pr probably the only kid that told my parents, guess what, you don't have to give me allowance anymore. I have a job. <laughs> um, so um, there's no difference. Yeah, that's just all I know. That's all I can remember. But I will say that, you know, having the experience of being an athlete does help because just like, you know, Tim was saying, it does show an employer that you can set goals, but it also shows that you're very disciplined. Um, it also shows that you have time management skills um, because obviously, you know, trying to get good grades and, you know, go to practice and you still got to stay up and eat dinner, take a shower, and now, you know, go to work sometimes, you know, night, night shift, morning shift, crazy hours. Um, it shows that you're multitasker. Um, it shows that in, in, corporate, in, being in having a corporate job, you do have to multitask. You have to learn how to set, um, you know, there's a lot of different tasks that you have to do in your job, but it's your duty to decide on what gets priority and to di differ differentiate what needs to be done right now and what could kind of be put off in an hour or two or tomorrow. So, you know, being an athlete, I, you you have to learn when to study. You know, you have quick break to eat, 
quick break to go to practice, quick break to have some time with your friends, like five, ten minutes, <laughs> you know. I yeah. Oh, it makes a huge I mean, difference, we, yeah. We're kind of suffering right now. I've been, I was a walk-on to the track team. That's something else. We both worked at Macy's. We both ran track at UCLA. She was ten times better than I was. Um, but what I will say is my two biggest breaks in my entire career, and I mean the biggest breaks, and I'm talking big jobs. The first time I was made president, I was hired by a CEO who went to Notre Dame. And he saw two things. He saw track UCLA and he saw UCLA. And he knew that the determination and the competitive spirit that I was going to be a winner. And he, you know, he had a saying, win with the winners. And his name is Paul Sharon. And, you know, that was really a huge change in my career. And the second one was this job coming back to L.A. Because my bo boss, Eric Wiseman, is a runner. And he knew that if he hired an athlete that he, he knew I could get through almost anything that they through my way. And so that was a really big determining point between why I got the job. I'm the first person they've ever hired at VF at my level from outside. And so he was taking a huge risk with me instead of doing an internal promotion, which is, you know, it was on, it's a 150-year-old company, so it was quite, quite um, a big deal. But he took a chance on me, and it was really because I was a UCLA athlete. Well, any last words? Any last uh, reflections, thoughts? Um, we will have a reception outside, and we can, you can ask uh, any personal questions you like to ask. I would like to thank our guests here for their wonderful <laughs> conversation.